Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to have you with us for our morning service here at West Kilbride Parish Church. Now, we've got a slightly different service this morning because we do have a guest speaker. Uh, we have Graham McMeekin from Tear Fund. As you know, uh, the church has supported the work of Tear Fund for many years now. And they got in touch with me recently saying that they hadn't managed to get to the church uh, to update us with some of their most recent work. Uh, but would we like to hear more about their work and they would send us something online. And so as our guest speaker, we have Graham McMeekin from Tear Fund uh, this morning. This morning is also a communion service, uh, as I said last week, and we're going to celebrate that virtually. So if you do, if you've forgotten about that, then it would be maybe helpful if you uh, managed to get your wine uh, or your grape juice uh, and got your bread ready for celebrating communion at the end of our service today. Just one more intimation, um, just to say, as I said last week about membership, uh, if anyone is interested in membership classes uh, or in professing faith, then please do get in touch with me. I'm hoping to start membership classes this week if possible. So please do get in touch uh, with me if you are interested in that. And just while I remember as well, uh, our Try Praying uh, initiative is still going. Uh, it will take place uh, throughout Lent, uh, all, all the way to, to Easter. Um, if you do want a booklet to give away, then there are still booklets at the church, uh, or please get in touch with me at the manse, and um, we'll be able to, to give you uh, some of those booklets. So let's begin our worship together this morning. The psalmist says this in Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Praise the Lord. Let's begin our worship together today. And our first hymn this morning is how lovely on the mountains.
Let's join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can come together this day, that we can come to praise your name, that we can gather around your word, and that we can celebrate communion together, even if it's in just a virtual way. We thank you that in celebrating communion, we are brought back to what is central in our faith, because we are brought back to the cross, the wondrous cross, where Jesus died, where we see your love, your mercy, and your justice meeting together. We thank you that when we gaze on that wondrous cross, that we see your character, that you are loving and compassionate, and that you are able to forgive our sin. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this day, there are many things that might concern us, concern us in our world, concern us in our own lives and in our own situations. We do pray for our world at this time, with all the difficulties that we find in our world. We recognize there is much inequality in our world. People who do not have clean water to drink, people who are in war-torn countries, people who are suffering, and do not have proper medical provision or even a home over their heads. And we do thank you for the work of organizations such as Tear Fund who are working in our world to try and make a world a more equal place and to share something of your compassion, your love and your grace. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, Perhaps we are concerned about the inequality we see in our own nation. We remember those who are homeless, those who are living each day on benefits, those who feel hopeless and who are in despair. And we pray even in our own nation that our nation would be a more fair place, a fair place for everyone. We do pray for our government and all the difficult decisions they have to make, especially recently because of the COVID outbreak and the restrictions they've had to put into place. We pray that you would guide and lead and that our government would be filled with people of integrity, that would work for the good of all the people. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we also remember those we know who are particularly struggling at this time. We remember those with mental health issues. We remember those who are depressed and dying. We remember those who are concerned or we are concerned about because of what they've been going through during this time of lockdown. And we ask that you would be close beside them. We pray for those, Lord God, who have lost their jobs or those who are furloughed and who are concerned about losing their jobs. We remember the grieving, those in hospital, those who are sick. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be close beside them. As we come before you, Lord God, we are grateful that you are sovereign, that you know the beginning from the end because you are the Alpha and the Omega. We thank you that everything is in your hands. And you're a God in whom we can truly trust. Heavenly Father, we ask that during this time of worship, as we sing together, as we pray together, as we gather around your word, that you would be with us and that you would encourage our faith in you. And if we realize, Lord God, that we are far from you, if we realize that we have backslidden in our faith, we ask that you would draw us back to yourself and that we might be a people who honour you and to glorify your name. So, Heavenly Father, hear this, our prayer, and hear us now as we pray together with the words Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hi West Kilbride Parish. It's great to be with you today, even if it is just online. I really wish I could be with you today and just go further down the coast and around the coast and just enjoy some of the scenery around there. But unfortunately today I'm here in my home in Renfrew near Glasgow, just a little bit further around the coast. My name's Graham McMeekin and I work for an organisation called Tear Fund. And before we look at today's passage, let me tell you just a little bit about Tear Fund, just in case you haven't heard of us or just don't know much about what we do. We at Tear Fund believe that poverty is not part of God's plan. Tear Fund work primarily through the local church around the world 
in order to unlock people's potential, in order to end poverty. The nature of the work varies from country to country. We operate in around 50 countries in around the world. And that looks different depending what country you're, you're looking at. Because each country and each place has different uh, things that affect it and that cause poverty. One of the types of work that we do, and probably the most well known, is our church and community transformation. Where we're looking and working with local churches in order for them to understand the needs of their local community. What could be more important just now than actually churches engaging with the local community, knowing and understanding what the issues are and being able to respond? In many of the countries, what that looks like is that they start by doing Bible studies, understanding what God has in store for them and looking at how God can multiply the gifts and offerings that they have. They'll maybe do Bible studies around the feeding of the 5,000 or the widow who had just a little bit of oil and how in all these things God was able to multiply them in order to meet the need. Churches around the world are doing Bible studies like that but then they're doing hard research on their local community in order to see how they can actually respond. And in some places that means that they're setting up new work programs in other places it means that they're teaching new skills. It varies from place to place. The second area of work that we're involved in is our advocacy work. That is about speaking up for injustices or things that actually continue to cause poverty. In a local level, that can be speaking to local councils or local uh, authority le leaders and saying that, we, that a village might need a new path or a new road so that they can get their food to the market and about campaigning and advocating on their behalf. But on a global scale, it can look like you know, how we campaign around climate change. How do we prevent the carbon emissions that we're producing in the West affecting those in the developing world or the majority world? The third area of work that we're involved in is our humanitarian response. Now sometimes this looks like uh, how we respond to hurricanes or floods or cyclones or any other natural disasters that take place. How do we ensure that people have the food that they need, the homes that they need, even if it's temporary accommodation? How do we ensure that they have just the basic, uh, the basic essentials around them? In the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic, it's maybe around water and sanitation facilities. How do we ensure that people have hand washing facilities whenever the nearest open water source or river might be a five hour walk away and they have to walk five hours to, to go there and five hours back? If, that, if that's what you have to do to get water, even just to drink, the idea of using it for hand washing and, and hygiene purposes is minimal. Another part of what we're doing is working in fragile states. That's part of our humanitarian work. Recently we've heard on the news things like northern Ethiopia, where the Tigray province, where there's been uh, all sorts of conflict going on, or in northern Mozambique. And we're responding to people in these situations, whether it's about uh, giving them the resources they, they need in terms of food and, and the essentials, uh, or whether it's about trying to rehome them, or whether it's about even cash handouts, uh, if they need because they just don't have the jobs because of the conflict and the structure just breaking down. This is just a flavour of some of the work that we are involved in. However, before we go any further, let us look at our passage this morning. Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city 
and set him on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. In the UK, we are now in that season where we're starting to leave the winter months behind us. All of that ice and snow that we had with that beast from the east too, and looking towards being in spring and the buds budding and looking for signs of green around us. But we're starting to put our minds towards the summer. Now we're not sure what the summer is going to look like, but many of us are still thinking about summer holidays. Is there a chance for us to even get away somewhere locally, just for a bit of a break and to start to plan? Of course, this year, holidays are going to look a bit different. They're not going to be the same as previous years, and there's all the uncertainty involved in that. But we still want to be making preparations, want to be thinking forward about what holiday plans we might have or what we might just do over the summer. The problem is that for so long we haven't really travelled anywhere. We've maybe forgotten what we need to do to really get prepared for that place. We need to think through what our plans are. So because it's been uh, quite a time since we've done any of that preparation, let's just have a moment and we'll go outside and we'll have a wee think about what we need to do to prepare. For most things that we do, preparation is really important. Even if it's as simple as whenever we get up in the morning, deciding what clothes we're going to wear, we'll look and see what the weather's going to be like. Whether it's going to be sunny or cold or wintry or whatever it might be. And so we decide whether we're going to wear shorts and t-shirt or three woolly jumpers. Obviously for us in Scotland, mostly the three woolly jumpers. But we always want to make preparations for those journeys. And if we're going for a longer journey, if we're going away on a holiday or something like that, then we need to think well in advance. We need to think through what we're going to need. Do we need to pack a bag? Do we need to bring toiletries? Do we need to bring suntan lotion? Do we need to bring multiple layers? Or do we just need to bring our shorts and t-shirt? And if we're going away in the car, we'll be thinking about what do we need to take with us in the car? What do we need to sort out? Do we need snacks for a journey? Do we need to put fuel in the car, fill up the tank? Do we need to check the oil, check the tires? You see, for most of us, if we're doing a short journey, we really don't have to think much about these things. But if we're going for a longer journey, we need to make the preparations. We need to plan for what is ahead. In the Christian calendar, we need to make preparations too. There are two real times that we think about preparation. The first one is in the lead up to Christmas. It's that period of Advent where we start to think about love, joy, hope and peace. All of which are in the four weeks leading up to Christmas where we are preparing for that major event which is the birth of Christ. But the second is a period of Lent. It's that 40 day period, not including Sundays, that's why the math doesn't quite work. But that period leading up to the Holy Week, 
where we are preparing ourselves for the events that take place that week and eventually the death and resurrection of Christ. But as we think about preparation, we know that for all things preparation is needed and that Jesus was needing to be prepared for it. And even before that 40 day period or the walk to Jerusalem, he was preparing for his whole ministry. Today's passage, we looked at a period where Jesus was being tempted. And that was a preparation for his ministry, a preparation for what was going to take place. After those series of temptations, he was then ready to go into ministry. And we were able to read that after that, in Luke chapter 4, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the Lord's year of the Lord's favour. Those words were the opening to his ministry, a ministry that involved parables, miracles, developing disciples, and eventually leading to the cross and his resurrection. But none of which would have been possible if he hadn't spent time in the desert preparing himself for that ministry. Time in prayer, time wrestling with the tempter, so that he could be resolute in his worship and in his trust in God. Even if we take that period in the lead up to the crucifixion, from the transfiguration, we're on that mountaintop, he is anointed and spoken to by God the Father. And if you read the end of that passage, it shows very clearly that he knew that after that he had to be resolute in going to Jerusalem. He knew that his calling was in Jerusalem and that's where he had to go. In fact, in Luke's Gospel, you can see that every reference after that, that he is certain that he needs to go there. But that mountaintop experience was part of the preparation, part of the calling, knowing that that's where he was going. And then as we reach Jerusalem and as we come towards that Good Friday, that first Good Friday, we see that period of preparation where he's speaking to people, where he's having his feet anointed and washed, where he's telling parables, where he's betrayed, all of which preparing for what is next. What was going to be fulfilled in Jerusalem, as it says in Luke chapter 9. Jesus' journey through villages and towns was quite an experience so much so that as he looked upon Jerusalem, he literally wept over it. In actual fact, as we get into Holy Week, one of the stories that he's told, one of the parables that he told, was about preparation. It was about ten virgins, who, five of which were prepared for what was happening, for the bridegroom coming back and for what was happening. The other five weren't prepared. And he's telling stories about the need for us to be ready and ready for anything. However, that's not always possible. We might think about being spiritually ready for what God has in store for us. But it takes something about understanding what is in hold for the future. But if you have all the uncertainty of what's ahead of you, then it's difficult to make preparations. We only know that far too well for the last year where we have had so many uncertainties and just not known what is before us. In many conflict situations around the world, that uncertainty is even greater. Take a beer, for example. A beer was in her early 20s living in a quiet village. And then all of a sudden, in her village in Iraq, ISIS came in. She had to get out quickly. She didn't have time to pack. She didn't have time to do anything. She just had to run. Her husband left ahead of them because he was more of a security risk and she followed as quickly as she could. 
Eventually they managed to reach a camp. But of course, with her and the two children that she had with her and her husband, they had nothing with them. She wasn't able to make the preparations. Let's hear some of her story. Currently, 79.5 million people worldwide have been forced to flee their homes. Many are living in tents, struggling with extreme temperatures in both summer and winter. I am living with my family in this camp. The conflict destroyed everything. This is not home. Home is my family and my relatives. I am always thinking about them. I'm still not comfortable. I miss them so much. We were fleeing from ISIS. We were scared and horrified. We just wanted to get away before we were caught. We left with only the clothes that we were wearing and we were scared. We walked through the whole night. There was so much fear. We were just crying and praying at that time. There is no comfort in the camp. The living situation in winter is so hard. My children get sick because it is too cold and we can't go outside because of the rain. When there is a storm, you feel like the tent is going to blow away. I fear for my children more than anything, but what can I do or where can I go? Tearfund support families like Abiyas around the world who no longer have a home due to conflict. We provided Abiyah with vouchers so she could buy the essentials her family needs. This kind of support is proven to be one of the most empowering ways to help people in need. It means people can make their own decisions, which helps uphold their dignity. The money we received helped us to buy clothes for the children, and this helped a lot. Last year, Dear Fund also set up a shop that was really helpful with winter clothes and shoes, and we received money to buy enough clothes. The children are very happy. I hope to see my children continue with school. I wish for peace and for a return to our homes. A group of incredibly generous Tear Fund supporters have offered to match every pound given to this appeal, up to one million pounds until the 30th of April, 2021. Your gift of £41 doubled could give three children clothing that fits them and protects them from the extremes of heat in summer and cold in winter. Our work is more stretched than ever with the impact of COVID-19 on those living in the most extreme poverty around the world. Please give today to support those where the need is greatest. Abir had no time to prepare, no time to get ready for what was ahead of them. She didn't have time to pack a bag full of clothes. She wasn't able to lift some of the children's toys. She wasn't able to pack those sentimental items to take with her. She just had to leave. No preparation involved. Now Abir and her husband and young children, they live in a temporary camp in a smelly tent that is the most close to what they could call as being home. And such a tent doesn't offer them protection, doesn't offer them protection against the weather, the extreme heat and the extreme cold that they have in places in Iraq. And it doesn't provide prote protection from the coronavirus. We talk about people having social distancing, washing their hands regularly with soap, etc. In a camp, 
the tents are packed so densely together because there's just not enough space that social distancing just can't be a factor. And there isn't the hand washing facilities because everything's been built so quickly that they haven't been able to put in the pipes for water flow. They haven't been able to put in the sewage that they might need. The water and sanitation facilities aren't what you would expect and offer little protection. However, Abir is just one of the 79.5 million people who have been forced to flee their homes. 79.5 million people worldwide. That's an extraordinary amount whenever you think about it. And to think about how they can actually do something to try and support those people in those areas. Tier Fund have been doing what we can, both with those in Iraq and also elsewhere around the world. We've supported 17,790 people through livelihood programmes in the last two years. And the last two years, we've also been able to support almost 31,000 people with cash, uh, cash vouchers or uh, grants in order to help them to get back on their feet. We're doing what we can to try and respond to those who just have not been able to prepare. They've had no choice. Circumstances have been so out with their control. We know God's plan is to bring healing and restoration where there is brokenness and suffering. So we partner with local churches and organisations all around the world in order to have a crucial role to play in this to help those worst affected by poverty. And as individuals and as churches, we can respond as well. We can use the potential that we've been given and the gifts that we've been given to respond to those in need. The local church over there are responding by providing warm clothes for those that need it to, to keep going through those winter months. They're supplying hygiene kits, building hand washing facilities and a whole range of other aspects so that the families can prepare for what the winter might bring so that they can be safe from illness and disease. You can join us in supporting the local church overseas and the work they are doing. During this Lent period, this period up until Easter, an incredible group of supporters have said that they will match every pound given, up to one million pound in donations in order to help people like Abir and others around the world who are in need. That is that they are, you are able to double the difference that you make. We at Tier Fund know that a gift of 35 pound doubled can provide six families with vital hygiene kits that include soap, antiseptic, toothpaste, sanitary towels, shampoo, washing powder, all to prevent the spread of coronavirus and other diseases. People in temporary camps, like the one the beer's in, need these desperately. The other thing that we can do is that we can pray. Let's just spend some time praying now. Come Holy Spirit, our hearts cry out for more of you, Lord. In a world full of brokenness, show us how to use our gifts to repair and restore. Spirit of peace, fall on places of conflict around the world. Heal divisions and hurts. Bring together families torn apart by war. Spirit of justice, anoint decision makers with wisdom to bring about systemic change and truth where cycles of poverty and bias have taken root. Come, Holy Spirit, we let you take control. Show us how we can build back better. Unite, bless others and renew. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. So we share. come this morning to gather together and to celebrate the Lord's Supper together and to remember all that Jesus has done for us. Even though we can't physically meet together in the church building, it's good that we can still celebrate uh, the sacrament of communion uh, in this way, uh, in a virtual way. And I hope wherever you are that you've got your bread ready and your wine or your grape juice, uh, whatever you have to hand. Uh, as we come back uh, to remember all that Jesus has done for us and the forgiveness of sins that is found in him. So as we gather together uh, this morning, let's gather around the table. Let's remember the goodness of Jesus. Let's hear these words from Matthew's Gospel, 
about the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for their forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I will drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. As we come to celebrate communion together, let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together uh, in this way. Though we might be separated, uh, we thank you that we can celebrate communion together, that we can remember all that Jesus has done, and we can come back to the central part of our faith. We thank you that these elements of bread and wine remind us of Jesus and all that he has done. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sake. His body was broken there. We thank you that Jesus' blood also was shed on that cross for the remission of sins. And we thank you, Lord God, that when we look at the cross, that we understand all your love for us, that we understand all you have done for us, that we might be cleansed, that we might be purified, and that we might come into your very presence. But Lord God, we thank you that as we gaze at that wondrous cross, that we also understand that that cross is empty because Jesus is risen from the dead. He is now alive and we can share in that new life with him forever and ever. And we pray that that would be our experience. So loving Lord God, as we gather around the table now, as we gather to celebrate together, we ask that you would bless these elements of bread and wine set apart for this holy use and sacrament. And we pray, Lord God, as we celebrate communion together, that your Holy Spirit might be with us and that we might know of your presence in a very real way. So Heavenly Father, bless us, watch over us, Bless these elements now. May we know the presence of your Holy Spirit. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we do this in obedience to Christ's example and command. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he'd given thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. So let's take and eat. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Eat this and remember him. Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood. Drink it and remember him. peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's join together once more in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness to us at the table of the Lord, where we have remembered Jesus, remembered all that he has done for us, that we have come to the foot of the cross. We have come 
to the empty tomb and we've remembered who Jesus is, our Saviour and yet our King. We pray, Lord God, as we've taken these elements today, that we might be nourished by them and that we might know of your presence through your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord God, that as we go out into the world, even in a limited way at this present time, that, Lord God, you would continue to help us to be good ambassadors for you in the place where you have sent us. So, Heavenly Father, watch over us, guard our hearts, and may we know the presence of your Holy Spirit now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, thank you for joining us today for our communion service. Please do remember that you can join with us for our evening reflection tonight at 6.50. And please do also remember our Zoom family service at 4 o'clock if you want to join in with that too. So thank you for being with us today. And we're now going to close with our final hymn.
Now, as always, wherever you've been joining us this morning from, uh, whether West Kilbride or Sea Mill, uh, the Three Towns Larg, Skelmerley, further abroad, it's been lovely to have you with us this morning uh, in worship and as we've celebrated communion together as well. Please do remember our four o'clock Zoom service. Please do also remember our 6.50 evening reflection. Let's just finish with the benediction. And now may the peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.